A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Philip went to a Samaritan town and proclaimed the Christ to them. The people united in welcoming the message Philip preached, either because they had heard of the miracles he worked or because they saw them for themselves. There were, for example, unclean spirits that came shrieking out of many who were possessed, and several paralytics and cripples were cured. As a result, there was great rejoicing in that town. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And they went down there and prayed for the Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had not come down on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Cry out with joy to God, all the earth. Cry out with joy to God, all the earth. O sing to the glory of his name. O render him glorious praise. Say to God, how tremendous your deeds. Cry out with joy to God, all the earth. Before you, all the earth shall bow, shall sing to you, sing to your name. Come and see the works of God, tremendous his deeds among men. Cry out with joy to God, all the earth. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river dry shod. Let our joy then be in him. He rules forever by his might. Cry out with joy to God, all the earth. Come and hear all who fear God. I will tell what he did for my soul. Blessed be God who did not reject my prayer nor withhold his love from me. Cry out with joy to God, all the earth. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Reverence the Lord Christ in your hearts and always have your answer ready for people who ask you the reason for the hope that you all have. But give it with courtesy and respect and with a clear conscience so that those who slander you when you are living a good life in Christ may be proved wrong in the accusations that they bring. And if it is the will of God that you should suffer, it is better to suffer for doing right than for doing wrong. Why, Christ himself, innocent though he was, had died once for sins, died for the guilty to lead us to God. In the body he was put to death, in the spirit he was raised to life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Jesus said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and we shall come to him. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I shall ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever, that spirit of truth whom the world can never receive, since it neither sees nor knows him. But you know him because he is with you, he is in you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come back to you. In a short time the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live and you will live. On that day you will understand that I am in my Father and you in me, and I in you. Anybody who receives my commandments and keeps them will be one who loves me, and anybody who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I shall love him, 
and show myself to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. With the uh, current dearth of live football in the UK at the moment, um, I've been searching around and so I found this um, series on Amazon, Amazon Prime. Um, other stream, streaming companies are available. Uh, and it's a series called All or Nothing about Manchester City. So they, the cameramen spent a whole year with Manchester City a couple of years ago and they document the whole series. And it's kind of like a, an injection of um, football, which is I'm missing at the moment. It's a great story. It's, um, it's, an, it's kind of behind the scenes, the things you wouldn't normally find out about a football club. And there was an interview in one of the episodes with Pep Guardiola, the manager of Manchester City, um, who many would say is the finest, one of the finest managers ever in the UK, maybe ever in Europe. And he said in this interview that for him, his whole philosophy, which is a very attacking minded football philosophy and quite unusual in the UK, he said, my philosophy comes from Johan Cruyff. Johan Cruyff was the manager of Barcelona when Guardiola was a footballer himself. So his coach, Johan Cruyff, gave him this philosophy. He taught him how to be attacking in his football um, and all the other sort of tactics. And he said, Johan Cruyff is so important in my management that I have a statue of him in my office. And he took it up. He showed us the statue of Johan Cruyff. He said, Johan Cruyff is always with us. He is always with us in Manchester City. That really struck me because that's a totally, um, it's a totally secular environment, obviously. It's, a, it's just a world of football. And yet Guardiola is saying there's someone in his life that is so much an example to him that he's, it's become kind of, he's with us always. He's kind of living with us. And I reflect on what that means for our faith. Is that what we believe? Jesus just said in the gospel there, on that day, you will understand that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. There are two reasons why our faith in Jesus Christ is not the same as that Johann Cruyff example. As great as that is, as great as it is to learn from our masters, our teachers, our parents, um, so many people influence us in our lives. And we could say so many people kind of come with us in the decisions we make. But there are two reasons why that's not the case with our relationship with Jesus. Because the first, rather than just being some kind of guru or some wise teacher or some example from the past, Jesus Christ truly lives inside us. That is the deepest truth of our faith that at the core of our being, God lives. Even just to get in touch with that is a remarkable truth, <laughs> a remarkable mystery. That if I dig down deep enough, <laughs> I don't reach nothing. I reach the core, which is God inside me. And the more I allow it, the more that comes to the surface and I don't have to dig anymore because actually God's life inside me becomes more and more visible to me and to those around me. That's the first reason. We don't just remember Jesus. We don't just have a statue of him and kind of, and say, well, he's really close to us because his teaching is close to us. He's really close to us because he is inside us. He is inside our hearts. Pope Francis said in a homily last, or an audience, a talk last week, he was giving a talk on prayer. And he said in, in the catechism and in so many spiritual writers, they talk about the heart of the Christian as the, the thing that prays. We pray in our heart. What does that mean, he said? It means not just praying in our minds, not just praying in our bodies, not just praying in our imagination or our words. To pray with the heart is to pray with my whole being. That is where the Lord lives, not the physical heart, 
that the truth of me, the depth of me, the deepest parts of me, that's where God is, is, is waiting almost, is waiting. He lives there, but it's, it's for me to open the door. So that's the first reason why Jesus is not like Johann Cruyff, <laughs> because he lives within us. The second reason is because the scriptures we just heard are not past tense. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I shall ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. He said that to his disciples. He said that in the context of the Last Supper. He said it once. It's recorded for us, as everything in the scriptures is said once and recorded for us. The scriptures, however, is not a past tense book. This passage to the disciples is not um, for its time only a one-off. It comes alive every time we allow the Lord to ask another advocate to come to be with us. The first reading as well. Philip has just baptised this Samaritan town, this pagan town, so a town that weren't Jews already. So that was monumental in the early church. He baptises this group of Samaritans, and then they need John, who is it? Peter and John need to come to them to give them the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what we do when, um, when the bishop, who is the apostle of today, comes to our parish and confirms, gives the sacrament of confirmation to um, those waiting for it, those ready for it? But if it were the case that the sacrament of baptism and the sacrament of, of confirmation were one-offs, then how our spiritual life could, could be so dry, how we could forget so easily the things of the spirit, the things, um, um, the things of faith. And so that's why this is not old news. This has to come alive again. And so it may be, St. Thomas Aquinas talks about this, it may be that in you and in me, the life of God, the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the comforter, the consoler, is dormant, not gone, not dead, but waiting to be released, waiting to be awoken. In um, spiritual writing, this has been referred to as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about it in the gospel. We hear about it in Acts of the Apostles today and in St. Paul's writing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm working through a video series with some young adults at the moment um, in our diocese. It's giving me great life. I really enjoy it. And uh, one of the episodes we just watched was on baptism in the Holy Spirit. And our discussion afterwards was, so, so what is, um, what's the difference? What, what does that even mean? What is a baptism in the Holy Spirit? Pope Benedict described it in 2008 when he went to World Youth Day. He said, that being baptized in the one spirit means being set on fire with the love of God. I wonder if you and I can truly say that for us. I wonder if you and I can truly say that that is a reality in our lives, that I am truly set on fire with the love of God. So the baptism in the Holy Spirit is not um, another sacrament or um, something that, I'm, um, that I forgot when I was a teenager, I should have done when I was a teenager. No, it's a reality for every single day to become a newly, a newly aware that God's love lives inside me. And that that is something to open myself to. It's not gonna happen automatically. It's not gonna happen by itself. I have to open the door. That beautiful painting you might've seen of um, um, Holman Hunt uh, of Jesus with the lantern knocking on the door. And there's ivy all over the door. And I think it's called the light of the world, the, the piece of art. And interestingly in that piece of artwork, there's no handle on Jesus' side of the door. He knocks and he waits for you and me to open. I will give you another advocate, or I will ask the Father, he will give you another advocate, another consoler, someone to come and live inside us. That's the truth of our faith. The Holy Spirit wants so much to come alive in us. And then just finally, what is the fruit of that? What, what's the proof that that's happening? What's the proof the Holy Spirit is alive in me? St. Paul talks about the nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, 
kindness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If any of those words hit you and you think, that isn't true in my life, then you are invited to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You are invited to open your heart once again to those fruits, to the way the Holy Spirit wants to come alive in you. We prayed in the psalm, cry out with joy to God all the earth. That was our response. Joy is the natural response in love. I remember um, when I was at university, um, I lived with a guy uh, who's actually listening on this live stream, so it's going to be very embarrassing now. But I, um, <laughs> he was really, he really liked this girl in the chaplaincy, in the Catholic chaplaincy. And uh, she wanted to be a nun, or at least was thinking about being a nun. And so she said to him, well, give me some time to pray, and, uh, and then, then we'll think about it. But give me the time. Anyway, in that time was when I was living with him. <laughs> well, he wasn't joyful. Let's just say that. He wasn't joyful. He was ticking down the days until he could meet with this girl again. And he was pretty down the whole time. And then the day came, he went to meet this girl and she said, actually, I don't wanna be a nun now. And I barely saw him the rest of the year, even though we were living together. And praise God, they're now married with three wonderful children. Joy was what I saw on his face as, saw his, as, as soon as he um, was able to go out with the girl of his dreams. Joy is a natural reaction for us as Christians if we are on fire with the love of God. If we have experienced that love face to face, Joy will be the natural fruit. In, po in uh, Pope Francis, um, one of his first letters as the Pope, he wrote a letter called Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. In that, he wrote a, a now famous line that said, um, Christians are not to be those who look like they've just come from a funeral. Christians instead are to overflow with joy. That doesn't mean going around with a smile all the time. Sometimes our life faces us with difficulties that, that we can't smile through. But what is it to be joyful? It's to know the love of God living within me. It's to know that in the midst of my darkness, there is light. In the tomb, there comes the resurrection. That the people around me I want to share my faith with, it overflows naturally. And so if none of this is true for you, Maybe this week is a time to invite the Holy Spirit into your life. Come Holy Spirit, just say it in your own words. Come Holy Spirit, come with your fruits, come with your gifts. Awaken in me what's lying there already from my, from my baptism, from my confirmation, which aren't past tense, but which are today. I am baptized, I am confirmed. Not I was, I am. I am a son of God, I'm a daughter of God. Just um, finally then, so this week, this Thursday is the Feast of the Ascension. I'm going to suggest an initiative um, on our YouTube channel for this, uh, for the week or the 10 days between the Ascension and the Feast of Pentecost. This is where we get the word novena from, from the, the days that the apostles uh, stayed in the upper room with Mary, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so in those nine days, I'm going to post online, not from me, but from different people, a video, a just a short 10 minute video about one of the fruits, one of the different fruits each day. There are nine fruits, nine days, one fruit each day, and a different speaker. I really encourage you to tune into that as part of your preparation for Pentecost. Because truly, he's waiting. Truly, he's waiting to set us on fire. In this extraordinary moment for the universe of the coronavirus, the Holy Spirit is truly part of that and waiting to bring us to life, waiting to use this hunger that we experience right now for the Lord, to use it for the glory of God, to use it so that when we come back to church, we come alive, we come with the gifts, we come with the fruits, we come as those who have, as Pope Benedict says, have been set on fire with the love of God. Let us pray that that becomes a reality more deeply every single day of our lives. We thank the Lord for raising us to new life and inviting us to these wonderful gifts.